From Hollywood, it's the Tom Likas Show. Everyone, please stand. And now, and now, here he is, Tom Likas. Thank you for tuning in to the Tom Likas Show. On this historic day, January 20th, 2009, you could not help but to be moved by this day. You, somebody as cynical and sarcastic as I, got up uh, here on the West Coast. Uh, the coverage began at 7 a.m., and I was up at the crack of dawn watching, uh, in my case, CNN every minute of it. And um, the into historic day, I can't believe that crowd and that miserable weather came out in such numbers because the vast majority of people at the inauguration of Barack Obama could not even see him. I mean, you want to watch this on uh, big screen, uh, why don't you get out of Circuit City where they have the big going out of business setting. So it's a big screen, you can watch it down there. Traveling to Washington, D.C. to stand a mile away. <laughs> That's pretty outrageous. But uh, he gave one hell of a speech today. This is uh, what Barack Obama sounded like uh, right after he was inaugurated as President of the United States. 44 Americans have now taken the presidential oath. The words have been spoken during rising tides of prosperity and the still waters of peace. Yet, every so often, the oath is taken amidst gathering clouds and raging storms. At these moments, America has carried on not simply because of the skill or vision of those in high office, but because we, the people, have remained faithful to the ideals of our forebears and true to our founding documents. So it has been, so it must be with this generation of Americans. That we are in the midst of crisis is now well understood. Our nation is at war against a far-reaching network of violence and hatred. Our economy is badly weakened, a consequence of greed and irresponsibility on the part of some, but also our collective failure to make hard choices and prepare the nation for a new age. Homes have been lost, jobs shed, businesses shuttered. Our health care is too costly, our schools fail too many, and each day brings further evidence that the ways we use energy strengthen our adversaries and threaten our planet. These are the indicators of crisis, subject to data and statistics, less measurable but no less profound is a sapping of confidence across our land. A nagging fear that America's decline is inevitable, that the next generation must lower its sights. Today I say to you that the challenges we face are real. They are serious and they are many. They will not be met easily or in a short span of time. But know this, America, they will be met. Very um, inspirational speech. I will say that um, almost every great inaugural speech had one thing that this one didn't. There was not one quote that everybody's going to remember, like, um, there's uh, nothing to fear but fear itself, or the only thing to fear is fear itself, or ask not what your country will do for you, ask what you will do for your country. There was not one line you could take away and sum it all up, but... It was a forceful and, I think, honest speech, balanced in that it was not uh, overly optimistic. It did not build up expectations uh, to a point that uh, the president will not be able to meet those expectations. What was interesting is his brief thank you to President George W. Bush followed by a pretty good public spanking of George W. Bush without mentioning his name. And, and you know, everyone's now kind of feeling warm and fuzzy about George W. Bush, but come on, the guy was such a moron, he probably didn't know Obama was kicking his butt. 
In fact, if I listened carefully enough, I think I also heard him kicking the butt of Bill Clinton and others. So, um, it's a historic day because, uh, obviously, there's never been an African-American president until today. It's a historic day because, uh, although we uh, pretty much are united on our dislike of George W. Bush as a politician and a president, um, a lot of things happened during his presidency, uh, not the least of which was the attacks of 9-11. The world has changed an awful lot since we had another president other than George W. Bush. Now, uh, we're going to take uh, an early break here. When I come back, I want to talk to uh, CBS News Cub reporter uh, Steve Funderman, who's on the scene in Washington, D.C., to give us some of the background of what happened. And, uh, of course, we're going to get your reaction to the inauguration of President Barack Obama. That's all we're doing on today's program uh, from every possible angle. And we're going to get your opinions and your thoughts, your feelings, and uh, you'll get to share those with me, and I'll get to share mine with you as we continue. Tom like it. 1-800-5800-TOM. 1-800-5800-86. The Tom Likas Show. Gather because we have chosen hope over fear. Unity of purpose over conflict and discord. On this day, we come to proclaim an end to the petty grievances and false promises, the recriminations and worn out dogmas that for far too long have strangled our politics. Barack Obama, now president. Barack Obama, shortly after his swearing in, at about 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time today. Joining us on the phone from Washington, D.C. is CBS News correspondent Steve Putterman. Uh, what's it like there in D.C. besides crowded? Well, it's a, a historic day, obviously. For the people who are close to the Obama campaign, a very moving day. Uh, just the people very inspired by Barack Obama. Obviously, there's a lot of craziness, a lot of security, as you might expect. Right now, I'm at the, uh, the Washington Convention Center, about to uh, go to one of the inaugural balls, which I've never been to before, Tom. I'm told they are not quite as uh, uh, luxurious or spectacular as the names might imply, but I will find out a bit later. I was at the Capitol today around, I would say, 30, 40 feet from Barack Obama, where the podium was with the uh, on the radio media riser that they had to the right of Barack Obama, and uh, it was just a pretty amazing day, you know, that, uh, full of, uh, you know, pomp and circumstance and also history as well. Now, uh, you talk about these inaugural balls, uh, there are so many of them. My understanding from people who've gone is that the, the president generally has time to drop in for about 10 minutes and then get out. He has to get to the next one. Yeah, they have, I believe, 11 of them this time. Barack Obama is going to spend, according to his schedule, which we have seen, around a half hour at each of them. He is expected, if he's on time, to return to the White House at 3 a.m. tomorrow morning. He is going to take a bit more time than uh, other candidates or other presidents have traditionally done. Not a lot of time, but uh, supposedly around a half hour at each inaugural ball. We'll make some comments at each of them and then go on to the next one. Now, Steve, uh, what kind of security clearance do you have to get? I mean, uh, we are seeing uh, Barack Obama on television getting out of the limousine, walking down the street, waving at people, walking up to people. So is Michelle Obama. What kind of security clearances do all those people have and how do they get there? They have, I believe they have all gone through security checks as far as their person, uh, anything they're carrying, have to go through those magnetometers. I've just been through a magnetometer, and uh, all my equipment has to go through one of those devices you see at the airport. Did you, uh, did, you have a, did you have a background check? I believe I did to get my pass that allowed me in the ca at the Capitol around 30 feet away. I and you, I and you, you cleared that? I, I Apparently so. I mean, I, I, when I get my press pass every year based in Los Angeles, obviously, obviously from the LAPD or the Sheriff's Department, I believe you go through a security check there as well. So, yes, my understanding is you do, uh, by having a request for these credentials that I had today, I, I guess you do give permission for them to conduct a background check. Wow. 
Unbelievable. Well, now, it's unbelievable, Tom, that I passed it. Well, that, for one. <laughs> the other is that they're checking on all of these people because there's a lot of people. I'm not just talking about, uh, and we'll talk about how big the crowd was in a second. I'm talking about all the people who were authorized. Uh, they had the, the tickets uh, that they got from their congressman or whoever. Yeah, but Tom, I'm not sure. I don't believe all the people, you know, all the, you know, million people who were in the mall. You have to, there are certain areas that are more secure than others. Where I was today in the radio gallery, just like I said, to the right of Obama, again, I estimate around 40 feet away from him. I, I, I obviously have to go through a security check. People who are very close inside that very, very tight perimeter must go through a very, uh, I would think, uh, rigorous background check. The farther away you are, the less the check is. And I think most of the people at the pedestrian mall today, you know, close to the Washington Monument, I think they just had to go through the uh, magnetometers and uh, uh, any any uh, physical check that might be required. Do we have uh, a reliable estimate as to how many people may have shown up today to see this? I've heard that I, I've heard that some people have an estimate. I have not been given one yet. You know, that's always controversial. Remember the the Million Man March? Were there really a was there really a million people? And uh, this can sometimes be a bit controversial. My guess would be that, uh, and this is really unscientific. My guess would be based on what I've heard uh, before about what the mall can hold that we clearly had over a million people at the inaugural ceremony today from the Capitol steps to the Washington Monument. Well, that's had us a lot of people. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And there were areas of Washington that were completely cordoned off. I, I left the Capitol a bit too late, wanted to cross uh, Constitution Avenue, and uh, no no go. I had to walk all the way around uh, uh, to the other side of the Capitol, up and over to areas that were uh, more were less secure. Uh, the area I was trying to get through was uh, being uh, held for Barack Obama. He was still inside the Capitol about to uh, take part in the inaugural parade. Now, did I see today that the, the uh, temperature was about 25 degrees Fahrenheit and the wind chill brought it down to about 17 degrees? Yeah, I, I, I think that was probably correct. Well, it must have been miserable to be standing out there all day long. It was not very pleasant, especially if you're not used to it, when you're usually based in Los Angeles. What was the uh, temperature in L.A. today, Tom? Was it oh, yeah. When I pulled in, it was 84 degrees here at yeah. the studio. Yes. Yeah. A, little, a, little, a little colder here in Washington. And uh, I had, uh, let's see, I had my shirt on. I had a flannel shirt over that. I had a uh, very, uh, very strong, like what they call that, northern light uh, ski jacket over that. And then I had a heavy coat over that had gloves with those hand warmers and toe warmers. I found out today sometimes those toe warmers and hand warmers are not warm enough. I, I understand. Now, we had uh, a bunch of stuff happening today, uh, and we'll, we'll get to Ted Kennedy in a minute, but uh, uh, we had today, among other things, I guess uh, the Obamas did something a little out of the ordinary. They escorted uh, President uh, and Mrs. Bush to the helicopter, uh, that would take them uh, off to their uh, airplane. That would take them to their final destination in Texas. Normally, the president, the new president, does not escort the former president to the helicopter. Uh, you know, I'm not sure about that. I some, for some reason I think I've seen it before. Well, obviously, if you go back to one of the more memorable inaugurations uh, when Gerald Ford became president, he did escort Richard Nixon to the helicopter on the White House lawn. But obviously, that was under non-traditional circumstances. So at least it's happened then. For some reason, I seem to think I saw some departure when George Herbert Walker Bush uh, may have escorted or may have taken Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan to a point and said goodbye. Maybe I'm just imagining it, but I, I sort of think I saw that before. But obviously what we saw today uh, sometimes doesn't happen. I, I think it was a nice gesture. Obviously, uh, these are two very different men. Uh, President Bush today, uh, Pre President Obama today certainly had, if you uh, read the speech, heard the speech, Strong words that you could interpret uh, uh, were strongly aimed at uh, George Walker Bush. Uh, it sort of reminded me of Ronald Reagan's speech, which, which seemed to be very critical of Jimmy Carter when he became president in 1981. And uh, let's talk a little bit about Ted Kennedy before we forget. Uh, Ted Kennedy uh, was at a lunch today, I, I imagine. Uh, who was at this lunch, by the way? 
This is a traditional lunch, a congressional lunch that the new president has inside the Capitol with members of Congress. It's a, it's a very symbolic lunch, and uh, uh, it, it happens. It happened eight years ago when uh, uh, George Bush took over. Uh, I'm not sure it happens when you're reelected, but it certainly happens when you are a new president. And like a, a more formality than anything else, you go in there, have your lunch, and then you uh, take part in the parade. So that's, that's what the lunch was all about. So Ted Kennedy apparently suffered a seizure in some way related to his brain cancer. And uh, when he suffered the seizure, nobody was really sure what happened or how serious it was. Do we have any late-breaking information on what's happening with Ted Kennedy? My, under, my understanding, and I've not gotten this from the hospital itself, is that uh, Ted Kennedy is doing okay. I don't know if he's going to remain in the hospital. Obviously, he's under, I would, I would assume, uh, somewhat constant medical uh, observation. Uh, whether this is a setback in his battle or not, or just uh, something that sometimes happens when you're facing the situation he faces, I do not know. I've not heard any specific medical bulletin from uh, the doctors treating Ted Kennedy. Wow. Uh, there was uh, a false report at that same time that Robert Byrd, uh, uh, Senator Robert Byrd, also suffered uh, some kind of medical emergency, but I guess it turned out he was just leaving with Kennedy. Yeah, that, that's what I've heard as well. I, I, I've not. This, this is not the part of the story I've been covering all day today, but I've, I've heard the same thing you're, you're hearing. Yeah. Oh. Now, uh, all right. So we've got uh, eleven inaugural balls tonight. Uh, who pays for these? I think that's a question a lot of people have. You watch that production on Sunday night, for example, on Home Box Office, and uh, clearly it was a super slick, super expensive presentation uh, with an all-star cast like U2 and uh, Garth Brooks and uh, Shakira. By the way, is she American? I don't think so. Um, and it was all these have people. To be a dumb, Tom, no rules that you have to be American to take part in these things. Well, I understand that. What I thought was interesting, and I'm sure some of our callers have an opinion about this, is that the only Hispanic American I saw up there was George Lopez. Well, I'm, yeah, well, I've seen George at uh, some of the trials I've covered, like what? in Santa Maria. <laughs> lots of, uh, seen uh, lots of diversity up there uh, in other ways, but uh, for some reason they left that group out. Interesting. I actually didn't notice it, but you may have a good point there. I mean, if they had to go to Colombia to find a Hispanic performer, I don't know what's going on. Well, I like Shakira. I have no problem. Oh, I have no problem there. looking at her. It's not, that's okay with me. Somebody told her to put some clothes on, though, which I think was a, probably a wise move, although certainly I would rather have seen her in less. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised you have that. I, I would have a feeling you're not alone in that uh, regard. So who pays for all of this? I mean, 11 inaugural balls, are they all paid by what? Charities, believe, campaign committees, the taxpayer? Who's paying? I do believe there is some taxpayer money involved, but largely paid for by private contributions, uh, uh, people who uh, want to give to the uh, Obama uh, inaugural committee are allowed to contribute, and it costs money to attend the balls as well. I don't know the exact breakdown, but I, I believe it's sort of a combination of, of all three uh, three methods. Wow. I know that uh, there's got to be a lot being spent, but of course, so much money is being thrown around now with the bailouts and the stimulus yeah, packages and what have you. I mean, who's going to notice? Well, you know, as some people have wondered, is this a wise move to have uh, a, a this type of inauguration that is, uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily over the top, but it's certainly uh, very, very uh, uh, fancy. It's very, very uh, expensive. It's, it's very, very... Uh, I would say, in a celebratory mood at the time, the nation is obviously facing a major economic crisis. Some have questioned uh, that, but I think the Obama campaign has said uh, uh, this is a night that they are allowed to celebrate, that they don't feel that it is over the top, that they understand the nation's needs, and they're going to address that. I think that is their spin on this right now. Very nice. Let's talk a little bit. Uh, but I know you've got to get back to work here. Let's talk a little bit here about uh, the mood in the crowd. Obviously, you saw people just openly weeping, praying, oh, yeah. singing. Was there any discord, any protest? We're still seeing protesters when the president, whoever the American president is, whether it was Clinton or Bush or the other Bush, uh, you, you're used to seeing protests. You're not seeing that today. Does that mean there aren't any protesters, or does that mean they're not showing? You know, I have not heard of any protests. I'll tell you the two things, Tom, today that, that stood out to me. And one of them actually, in a way, is a protest. Uh, when 
George W. Bush was introduced as for the last time as president, when for the last time the military band played Ruffles and Flourishes and Hail to the Chief for George Walker Bush. The crowd, especially in the pedestrian mall, the you know, the the, the street people, if you will, the regular people, uh, they booed very loudly. Did all of them boo? I'm not sure. Where I was basically had a great deal of silence a smattering of booze, but there were very loud boos in that large pedestrian mall. I talked to people who were there. They heard it, too. Some of the crowd began chanting. If you've ever been to some of those sporting events where the home team's about to wrap things up, that na-na-na-na, hey-hey, goodbye, some of the crowd began chanting that as well. So uh, that was something I had never heard of at any inauguration before, such discord aimed at the outgoing president. Then, when his helicopter took off, they were sure I was on the other side of the Capitol. They were showing the, the picture on the large video screen. And the, the, the Obama supporters who were still there began a very derisive type cheer. It was uh, basically saying, in my interpretation, it was basically saying good riddance to George W. Bush, this from the Obama people. And that, that's how I interpreted their uh, very... Uh, caustic cheers as the helicopter rose and took George W. Bush to the airport for his flight to Texas. You've covered these before, Steve. Uh, was this different? I've only been to one time. I was at the Clinton inaugural, first inaugural in 1993. Yeah, I think this was remarkably different. I, this was historic, Tom. I don't think there's ever been any inauguration quite like this or ever will be. The other thing that struck me in a, a more positive way from the, the crowd here, they did treat you. You've heard, I, I think, conservatives sort of criticize Barack Obama, saying, well, he's nothing more than a rock star. Well, you know, the way people were reacting to him today, uh, they viewed him in a, in a very rock star-like way. They were actually chanting a few times. You heard people chanting, Obama, Obama, just like a campaign rally. I've never heard of that actually happening at an inauguration before. So it had that, that aspect as well. So I do think, yes, this was a different kind of inauguration because of the history, because of the symbolism, the first African-American. Uh, this is something that's never happened before, and obviously once it's happened once, it can never be the first time again. So I do think very likely th this may be a type of inauguration you may never see again. Steve, always a pleasure. As you know, all kidding aside, uh, great to hear from you, and I know it's a very special day today. I didn't really want to make too much light of this because I know people are taking it very seriously, and I uh, we'll talk again soon, of course. Next time we can make light of whatever I'm covering. Absolutely. We certainly okay. have more of you. We got a deal. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It's CBS News radio correspondent Steve Futterman uh, coming to you from Washington, D.C. Uh, he is reporting from the festivities surrounding the inauguration of President Barack Obama. Does that sound strange? You know it does. All right. Your telephone calls on this special and historic day coming up next. Tom like it. 1-800-5800-TOM. 1-800-5800-866. The Tom Likas Show. We remain a young nation, but in the words of Scripture, the time has come to set aside childish things. The time has come to reaffirm our enduring spirit, to choose our better history, to carry forward that precious gift, that noble idea passed on from generation to generation, the God-given promise that all are equal, all are free, and all deserve a chance to pursue their full measure of happiness. That's President Barack Obama. Shortly after being sworn in today at about 12.30 Eastern Time, about 9.30 a.m. Los Angeles time. Your telephone calls now on this historic day at one 800 800 Tom will take some general calls, and then we'll drill down to some specifics uh, as we go here. Ryan on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Likas, how you doing? Big fan. Doing great. Yeah, uh, I wanted to talk about the uh, the uh, Palestine and uh, Israeli conflict on the Gaza Strip. I know the U.S. has taken a strong stance with uh, the Israelis uh, historically, and I'm sure Obama would do the same, but... Um, I'm actually taking a class on the issue, and the more I hear about uh, the uh, the issues, the more I, I side, I'm siding with the Palestinians. Uh, I think last week the the figures were there was a thousand Palestinian casualties, and a third of them were uh, children. 
So I know there's atrocities on both sides, but I'm just curious what you think our our policy or Obama's policy should be uh, on the Gaza Strip. Well, I think uh, yeah, you'll notice that um, Israel has kind of toned things down so as not to uh, have any bad news happen during the inauguration of President Obama. Yeah, the ceasefire and everything? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, I, I do think, though, that's obviously going to be a challenge ahead. Yeah, I know I know you're uh, an atheist, is that, is that right? Yes. So, I mean, you, you can't, like really uh, side with the Israelis who justify the takeover I of the land. I personally, uh, I do not believe in using biblical scripture to settle a real estate dispute. So what do you think justifies uh, the Israeli stance on, on the, the takeover? Oh, I, I didn't say they're justified. You said that. <laughs> oh, okay, well, I'm I, just curious what you, what you think I, uh, is going on. Personally, I believe that a settlement... You know, I, I, I must say, my grandfather was Jewish. I grew up in a 99% Jewish neighborhood. And um, there are so many members of the Jewish faith who are attorneys. And um, attorneys know better than anybody that when you want to settle a dispute, uh, you go to arbitration or you negotiate a settlement. That's mm -hmm. what you do. And it's uh, my belief that uh, Scripture proves absolutely nothing. From the perspective of an atheist, uh, I don't care what the Old Testament says, the New Testament says, the Torah says, the Koran says... I really don't care. This is clearly a dispute between neighbors that has to be resolved, I believe, uh, with negotiation. Mm -hmm. Not I mean, bombs. That's been going on since, what is it, the, the 50s, and not much progress has been made. So, yeah, I was just curious what you think Obama should be doing over there. But, I mean, there's really no clear-cut you know, things we could do. Or else it probably would have been done over the past, what is it, 50, 60 years. Well, that's the thing. I, uh, you know, there's just a lot of bombs being dropped, and then a lot of opportunistic politicians, including people like the mayor of Los Angeles, who get out there and just, uh, you know, they blatantly support Israel without really having any particular stake in it, except they're hoping that that uh, Jews are watching so that they'll vote for them the next time they run for office. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, I, I believe other solutions have to be found other than bombs. Jimmy Carter was on the right track. It was one of the few things he did really right when he was president. And I think uh, we need more of that and less of this. Yeah, I agree 100%. Thanks for having me on, Mike. I'm late for class. So uh, you taking me out old school? Uh, yeah, here you go. You ready? It's 1-800-5800-TOM. It's our telephone number. Bill on the top. Like his show. Hello. On a piece of a rock. That's my new theme song, Tom. <laughs> well, you must have spent the whole day thinking of that, huh? <laughs> we, should, we should copyright that. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm just wondering what you think the stock market's going to do now. That, uh, well, you see what it did today. The stock market was in the crapper today. This yeah. was the worst Inauguration Day stock market. I think since they've been keeping records, if you've been uh, paying attention to that kind of thing, uh, there yeah. was terrible news in the banking industry today, and the Dow yeah. Jones Industrial Average was down 332 points, about 4%. NASDAQ was down almost 6%, 88 points. And uh, the S&P 500 uh, was uh, down 5%, or about 45 points. Wow. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, I figured uh, if anybody might know with some hindsight, it might be you. I, I heard a little bit on the news that it was down and thought, so hmm, I wonder what, where this is going to take us, you know? But, uh, I guess well, we'll find I, out. well, here's the thing. Uh, first of all, it'll be interesting to see what happens when the president is honest about how bad things are. Generally, okay. the last president was very big on saying, we're not in a recession. It's not a recession. Uh, we're still strong. We still the basic foundation is still there. We're still strong, you know. Right. So obviously, right. uh, if somebody watched this inauguration address today, expecting him to say all things are better than they seem, well, they didn't get that. And you see what happened to the stock market. Sure. So Absolutely. the question is: Does Wall Street still want to get these uh, rah rah boom boom you know speeches where the president gets up there and lies about how great things are? Yeah. Can they handle it as adults uh, hearing the real truth? And the real truth is we're in the tank right now. Yeah. Well, we will see what uh, we'll see what he does for us, man. Time will tell, won't it? You know. Well, we uh, time will tell. I mean, uh, but believe me, we're all in the same soup. 
Yes, so uh, we, we have to all hope that he that he knows as much as he seems to know. Absolutely. I voted for him. I'm rooting for him. I support him in every possible way. Uh, will he do it? Oh, boy, I, he, he better. Who knows? I mean, we're all screwed if he doesn't. That's true. Change is good, and I hope he makes some good changes. Well, I hope so, too. Can you blow me up, Tom? I certainly can. One eight hundred five eight hundred. Tom is our telephone number. This is uh, let's see. Uh, Randall on the Tom like a show. Hello. Hi. I'm. Uh, I hope uh, Brock is probably the smartest guy around. And I, but I remember back that uh, President Carter was the smartest guy around. And the trouble was he tried to do everything on his own and got bogged down in the details. And I hope uh, you know I hope Barack gets some really smart people and delegates to him. It looks like he's doing that now. But I, I hope him the best. Well, we all have to wish him the best, uh, because, let's face it, our future is in his hands. Uh, and uh, right now is a critical time in our history. I mean, this is one of those uh, make-it-or-break-it times in the history of the United States. I agree. So, Thank you. I, I, all the, all the uh, you know, the uh, Rush, Limbaugh, Bill O'Reilly, Sean Hannity, baloney that floats around out there, I think the American people are tired of it. I really think there's no room for that right now. I do, too. Thanks a lot, Tom. Thank you. It's 1-800-5800-TOM. That's our telephone number. Uh, let's say hello here to Zach on the Tom Likas show. Tommy, how's it going, buddy? It's going okay. It's a good day. You know, um, I thought his inauguration speech was excellent, especially when he starts talking about our en enemies and how we're going to outlast them and how we will defeat them. I love that That kind of soft, uh, speak softly but carry a big stick kind of talk. It sounds better than... um. Bring them on, or we'll smoke them out of their holes. You know of what I mean? Of course, of course, it sounded better. Uh, you know, okay. when he closes down Guantanamo Bay, when he says the United States does not torture people, uh, he, he look, he's hit all the right notes on that. Yeah, now we have sure, to man. see if it uh, if it has the desired effect. Now, um, I do a lot of traveling, especially to Europe, and uh, Europe uh, has some of our biggest critics, and they love this guy. They okay. love him. Hey, so can I, can I get a bonk hit for our new president, uh, President Obama? Yes, you certainly can. Can we all just get a bonk? Tom Likas. 1-800-5800-TOM. 1-800-5800-866. The Tom Likas Show. Like show. It's the Tom Likas Show from Hollywood. And here we are on the day of the inauguration of President Barack Hussein Obama. Or as he was called when he's introduced today, Barack H. Obama. 1-800-5800-TOM. It's our telephone. We're getting your visceral reaction to the inauguration of the 44th and first African-American president of the United States. 1-800-5800-TOM. That's our telephone number. Let's say hello here to Jason on the Tom Likas Show. How's it going, Tom? That's going pretty well. Hi, everybody always asks you that. It's just uh, that's just what you say. But, uh, yep, I don't know. Uh, Obama, I, I, mean, I really haven't paid much attention to the politics throughout my life, but uh, I've been kind of paying attention to this one. And, you know, everybody's talking about change, but... Uh, you know, it's, I just hope it's changed for the good. I, whenever, every, you know, whenever, uh, whenever it hits the fan, I hope you know a lot of people are probably going to be surprised and wonder what the heck happened. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have very short memories in this country. That's why we can't stay at war for very long. Uh, you remember the Iraq War? It was the best thing since sliced bread. And uh, oh yeah, Bush yeah, the second had a ninety-one percent approval rating or something like that, and he left office with the lowest approval rating since Nixon. Yeah. And, and 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 that has more to do with the fact the American it was the same war in Iraq by the way <laughs> that they loved pieces um, all this love you're seeing for Obama today 
will start to crumble in six months if the unemployment rate continues to go up, if the stock market continues to go down, which is very likely. Yeah, I was uh, I was in Texas around that time, and all I know, all my uncles, they, everybody, they were uh, they were getting the shotguns out and loading them up, you know, in case anything crazy happens. But uh, you know, I, I I don't got nothing nothing against them. Hopefully, everything turns out good. Uh, and I, I just think it's kind of crazy, you know, his name and everything being a president of the United States. I bet over you know the Taliban, everybody's probably laughing at us now. But uh, we'll have to see what happens. <laughs> Well, we're all going to see what happens. We have to hope that uh, he does the right things here. Blake on the Tom Likas Show. Hello. Good. How are you? Great. Hey, I, I was just curious. Are you familiar with the 20th Amendment? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so Biden was president for half an hour today, right? No. Biden was not president for half an hour. Uh, the president uh, became the president at 12 noon, even though he had not taken the oath of office. So can they file charges because he, he violated the constitution or well that actually that's that he did not violate the constitution i've got that amendment in front of me here yeah. yes and that's okay. yeah, you you've read it wrong the 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 president-elect becomes the president at 12 noon regardless of whether he's taken the oath of office okay that is what the amendment says and that is what happened Okay. I so, so Biden was never the president and uh, should never have been the president. He was the vice president. All right, very good. Can you take me on O'Reilly style? Bill O'Reilly style, I certainly can. I can't do it. Okay. We'll do it live. Okay. We'll, no. we'll do it live! F*** it! Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Right. F***ing thing sucks! one eight hundred five eight hundred Tom. That's our telephone number. Let's say hello here to uh, John on the Tom Likas show. Hello. Hey, Tom. How are you? I I can't hear you, John. You're cutting out. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. Well, uh, well, first things first. Very happy about Obama, but uh, I want to know what you think if if Obama will push towards um, Bush or Cheney being charged for any war crimes. Um, I I would not bet my life savings on that ever happening. Why? Because we have a history in this country, and uh, let's use as the most recent example, uh, 36 years ago, uh, when Richard Nixon was forced to resign and was then pardoned by President Ford. Uh, we have a history in this country of uh, just moving ahead, moving forward, and not going back and prosecuting people for stuff that happened in the past. That is the way it has been. And I, you, I'm, not saying whether, that, I'm not saying whether I'm not saying whether wait 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 don't mistake what I'm saying I'm not saying whether it should or shouldn't happen I said it won't happen. Okay, well uh, my understanding obviously Obama has a comment that he is just going to push forward and forget the past, but don't you think that he is going to get way less on that fact of the matter and might be forced to make a decision on that? Nope, I, I think it's going to be uh, put aside. In the interest of fixing the economy and dealing with the issues that are coming up now. I do not think he'll be forced to do anything, and I don't think he will. And you heard it here first. Well, last, I, one I, last question. Uh, Air America and Randy Rhodes can rant and rave about this all they want. It's do not going to happen. And do you think that Cheney and Bush will never be able to travel the world ever again because they will be looked at as uh, be uh, breaching the... Uh, Gina convention throughout the world. Oh, I can't say go. I can't say what the rest of the world will do, but we won't do anything. Hmm. Oh, whatever. And by the way, does George Bush look like the kind of guy who likes traveling around the world? Well, Texas is a big place. Uh, or 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 Dick Cheney for that matter. In his wheelchair, I'm sure he can get a lot a lot of distance in that. Did you know he was in a wheelchair? Yes, well, uh, I'm, I think it was, what was like a like a accident playing basketball or something. No, no, no. It, he had an accident. Uh, he, he was arranging the things in his new home in the <laughs> suburbs of Washington D.C. and he had an accident at home. Oh my! <laughs> well, well, can you take me out, uh, Kobe style? Here you go, John. Oh. Oh. This is about us. Oh. She's so special to me. Oh. Yeah, it beats in my heart. Yeah, the air I breathe. She's so special to me. It's 1-800-5800-TOM. That's our telephone number. Let's say hello here to Niza on the Tom Likas Show. Hi, Tom. How are you? Great. 
Yeah, it's uh, Nitzam, but never mind. I wanted to talk about that guy that said uh, they talked about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And uh, as an Israeli person, I, I was very, very offended by what he said. Because it's very, well, what very he untrue. said. He said, wait, wait, stop. He said lots of things. What are you referring to? He said basically what I was offended by that he said that uh, he supports more the Palestinian side of it, and because he was studying it in school. Well, unfortunately, or to his fortune, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I want to see him living in uh, a city that every day he might get blown to bits by some kind of rocket or missile. Or what not? Well, um, you know, I understand the point of view of people from Israel. I have an ex-girlfriend who was an Israeli army captain. I'm very familiar with the concerns of Israelis. Uh, I'm also concerned about the security of the United States of America. And there are times when Israel's presence in the Middle East has been very helpful to the security of the United States. There are other times when I worry about uh, the aggressive actions that Israel can take when they feel it's justified and what that does to the security of the United States. Yeah, I, I agree with you that there, there's not supposed to be that many civilian casualties. It doesn't matter if it's children, women, men. It doesn't matter. But, uh, well, I, I think that in the last while, before this action took place, the Israeli government was pretty lenient. You know, every day, rocket shooting, and we left the Gaza Strip two years, three years ago, and I was there when it happened. We left there, and we, we when we left, they were shooting at us, you know. So we left there, we did what we needed to do. So they're still shooting the missiles, they're still doing whatever they need to do. Um, you know, whatever they want to do. So how long can you take it? Well, uh, but again, uh, then the question becomes, uh, you know, how far does the United States go in supporting every action that Israel takes? Because when Israel gets aggressive, it not only threatens Israel's security, but it threatens ours. Yeah, I agree with you about that, but... We're, and you know and we, right now, we right now are not the big, strong United States uh, that we used to be. We are defensively weakened, uh, economically weakened. We're at a very delicate point in our history. We, we, have, we have been a victim of one of the biggest terrorist acts of the century. <laughs> and at some point, uh, we have to decide to fish or cut bait with the actions of the state of Israel. And that's a decision that Barack Obama is going to have to make, among others. Thanks a lot for the call. The Tom Likas Show.